Hey everybody, welcome back to our officially first episode of front suspension geometry for a double wishbone suspension. Finally, we've been able to come back. Uh, I didn't realize how difficult this was going to be. It's really the start of race season, so we've just been going non-stop, really busy, um, which is a good problem to have, but a problem nonetheless, which made it really difficult to get on to um, finishing up this series. So today we're going to be going and talking about camber and how it's affected, when does it change, and all sorts of details to do with camber specifically. But first off, we're going to show you how camber is adjusted typically on a double wishbone suspension design. So let's just start with the basics. I'm going to show you the most common way to, to increase your camber and what we're going to find increases your camber is simply when users lower their vehicles. Typically, they're going to be gaining camber because of the upper control arm's pitch in relation to the lower control arm. So if we're looking at the upper control arm, it's probably going to be situated in a way that's parallel or slightly leaning back. This is a favorable design because under compression, the wheel is going to gain camber because the distance of the upper control arm is shortening as the wheel goes up pulling the top of the wheel inward. And the reason this is beneficial is because while you're cornering, the outside of the wheel is compressing and you're gonna want to be gaining camber to compensate for the, um, basically for the slip angle of the tire. So as you're turning and the wheel's gaining camber and all of the load of the car goes onto that outside wheel, you wanna be angling that wheel to have a better attack angle to the pavement so that you have the most grip available. So the upper control arm is usually situated in a way that gains camber under compression. And you'll also notice that the majority of the time the upper control arm is much shorter than the lower control arm. This is to the same effect. You're going to have more change in dynamic on the upper control arm than you are on the lower and this is favorable for cornering. A couple other points you'll notice that the upper control arm mounts actually further away from the chassis than the lower and then to gain our to get our kingpin axis it mounts um, further inward on the knuckle side as well. So overall the upper control arm is much shorter in both directions than the lower and this is favorable for grip driving. But when we're drifting, what do we need to change? So for drifting, we're going to change a couple of these kinematics like the uh, distance between the outer ball joints on the upper and the lower. We're going to uh, lengthen the upper, we're going to shorten the upper. Two hours later. So we got a little carried away there on the intro, but uh, back to the point form of the video. Let's start with what causes camber to change? It's a great question. First off, we're going to look at the relation between the upper control arm and the lower control arm. Just to make it real simple, this is something that you'll never be able to visually see on a car, but on this display you can. If I lengthened the distance between the outer ball joints on the lower and the upper, just by extending this section of the knuckle here, you can see that this dramatically changes the camber. This is something that we're able to manipulate when we make our own steering knuckles um, because we can change the height or this distance on our drifting knuckles in comparison to the OEM knuckles which were designed for an entirely different purpose. They were for regular road use or for some slight performance. It's a production car so mostly for road use and slight performance advantages for cornering and, and stuff like that. So you can see if I set this up to be somewhat of a standard design, I would put the upper somewhere around this position. From this angle, you'll be able to see that the upper control arm has a slight upward angle, the lower control arm has a slight downward angle, and throughout our travel range, we're going to see that this is going to influence a negative camber gain under compression. And the reason for that is because the radius of the arc of the upper control arm is significantly smaller than the radius of the lower control arm. And we are already on a shortening or basically we're past our normal or our level plane and we're going backwards now, which is pulling the top of the knuckle inward, which is gaining camber. So that's one aspect of gaining camber on a double wishbone suspension. The next point to note when you're 
looking at a double wishbone suspension on camber gain is throughout its steering travel range, you're going to gain camber and lose camber the same way that you would on a McPherson strut. So basically your kingpin axis, which runs through our upper and lower ball joint and our caster angle, which from a side plane is the angle of which that goes through the outer ball joint on the lower and the upper. And these angles play a huge role while you're turning. They subtract and add to each other throughout the travel range, giving you positive camber going one direction and severe negative camber going in the other direction. And these are all things to note, particularly for drifting, because we are going at such a high steering angle. Um, for grip driving, you really aren't doing much more than 10 to 15 degrees um, while racing on track. So these, these are important factors to think of, but they're not nearly as important as drifting because everything becomes exaggerated. Once you bring the wheel to like 70 degrees, it changes everything. So the next thing to note would be what I touched on before, which is just the change in ride height. Everyone lowers their car, they put coilovers on, and they drop their originally designed ride height by two to four inches on average. And doing this is going to gain camber for the reasons that I explained um, a couple minutes ago because of the angle of the upper control arm and the relation that it has. As you lower the car, it's going to gain camber. So some modifications you can do is actually shortening the knuckle itself, like I can do easily on the jig, or an entirely new reverse engineered knuckle that is built shorter so that you don't have those undesirable things. And this goes hand in hand with like correcting the roll center as well, because the angle of the lower control arm and the upper control arm are determining your roll center. So that is another thing that you want to um, account for when making a new knuckle or when lowering your car, but uh, roll center will be a different topic of discussion. So from here, my next point is how do you know what camber you should be running? Um, for grip driving, this is a complex equation that you have to factor in a lot of things for the amount of camber that you should run static and then the amount of camber that you want to see gaining while driving. And it has to do a lot with the tire compound and the corner balance of your car and so on and so forth. We're not really going to get into it because this video is to show you how everything works and then give you the understanding to decide for yourself what you need to set up for. But for drifting, it's relatively simple. Basically, what we want to do is find the point at which we're going to be driving the most at while drifting, which is around 40 to 45 degrees of angle is where we're gonna be doing the majority of our driving. And at that point, we wanna set up our alignment so that we have a good contact patch, some jacking, but fairly minimal so that it doesn't affect your bump steer or anything else too much while you're driving because if you're running crazy caster angles, that is gonna mess up with um, some other stuff. And a general rule of thumb is you wanna think of your camber as subtracting from your caster while drifting at lock. So for example, if we're gonna set up this jig to run six and a half degrees of caster, we're gonna to wanna to have our camber relative to that caster. So let's go into an actual demonstration where we set up real numbers and then measure at around 45 degrees of lock what our camber is going to be and then what changes we need to make to our alignment in order to get the optimal camber setting. So here we are uh, at the best visual demonstration for a double wishbone suspension and camber possible. First off, let's point out which side of this jig is the front of the vehicle. This side is the front. We're looking at a, the passenger side of the vehicle. It is a front rack steering car. That means when we are turning to the right, this is our lead wheel while drifting. So this would be our trail. This would be our lead. And with this, we're gonna measure our camber going throughout our sweep range. So I set up the jig to have eight degrees of caster. So you can see here, we're reading 81.7, kind of floats around, which is minus 90. It's about eight degrees, 8.3. And on our camber, we went super conservative 
and we're sitting at two. Okay, so 87.8, it was just at 88. Okay, so right around negative two. And if we just quickly turn our wheel to go full lock on the lead side, you can visually see that it's already leaning. So if we throw the level on it, we are reading 84.4. So going to full lock, we have gained minus two plus six. So we've gained eight degrees in camber throughout our sweep. That's from zero going straight to around, this may be around 60 degrees, 70 degrees. And if we measured it at like, let's say 45, you're going to get a different reading, but you will see that progressively it does gain. So around 40, Five degrees, we're sitting at uh, positive three. So that means we went from negative two to positive three, we gained five degrees of positive camber. So how do we, how do we fix this? How do we go ahead and, and get a better angle on our lead wheel? To fix this, we're gonna need to increase our static camber value. Simply extending this outer joint, If we actually tried to equal the value of caster, let's see what happens. So we have eight degrees of caster and we're going to equal that in camber. Right now we're sitting at negative seven. So let's go just a little bit further on this adjustment. Let's see if we can get it to negative eight. So we're at 82.0. So we're right at eight degrees of static camber. Now let's see what happens when we go to full lock with our static camber changed. I just gotta move my little lock stops a bit because I extended it without adjusting the tie rod. Anyways, let's check this right around our full lock range. We've matched our static camber to our caster and we're sitting at 89 degrees at full lock, which is measured from, so there's 90. So right around, I'd say probably 50 degrees. We have hit 90 degrees. So this wheel is tracking perfectly straight up and down while in drift. This is where you see on the um, further developed angle kits when, uh, one of the, when a drift car goes to lock, that lead wheel is planted with a full contact patch. This is what they have built into their knuckle to accommodate for. So to get that type of traction, you need to make a couple changes like you've just seen to your alignment and to the geometry of the knuckle. This is kind of set up to be the way that I would want it to be for drifting. But if you just took a standard car knuckle that had unmovable points, like let's say the knuckle is built out of aluminum. So to change any of the pickup points would be pretty extensive. With steel, you can cut and weld and manipulate it, but with aluminum, not so much. You're going to have a hard time getting that perfect angle. And a great example of this would be our 350Z regular kits that bolt to the factory steering knuckle. Um, comparing that to our Mega Mantis kit, what you have as a major difference is the factory knuckle is running a stock caster value of around between eight and nine degrees. And in order to counteract that caster, we're running anywhere from minus five to minus seven degrees, and we're still getting a decent amount of wheel flop. Um, and then especially on the trail wheel, you have a pretty, drastic downside on the trail wheel when you're running these high values because on the trail wheel your caster actually adds to the camber so if you had minus eight static camber to counteract your caster angle that's going to double itself on the trail so you're now going to have eight degrees of caster plus eight degrees of camber your trail wheel may be anywhere from like minus 13 to minus 15 degrees of camber on the trail wheel and you'll definitely be able to see this on regular kits that use the factory knuckle on 350Zs. If we're going to reference anything specifically, um, that's a pretty easy one to look at. That is a double wishbone and that you can see that effect. And then opposite to that, if you checked out the how planted uh, the wheels are on like our Mega Mantis kit or on other um, engineered kits, you'll see that the wheels are perfectly planted and have a much better contact point, which as a result gives you uh, better in corner speed while drifting, uh, overall contact patch to handle the, if you're running a lot of grip in the rear or if you're trying to adjust your line, 
Um, all those small adjustments made with the steering wheel are going to be a lot more drastic or a lot more effective if you have better grip in the front. So to close, that is a basic understanding of camber and how it relates to double wishbone suspension, um, how you can expect to see changes and differences throughout its travel range, throughout steering, um, under compression and all sorts of stuff. Thank you for watching. Uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode, which is going to be caster and how caster relates to double wishbone, how you adjust it, how you set it up. Throughout the episodes, we really touch on basically a little bit of everything because you can't really look at one without the other, but focusing on caster is what the next episode is gonna be on. So yeah, we'll see you guys there. Over and out. <laughs>